Hi, I'm going to talk about the Maryland Coastal Bays as a case study. Maryland Coastal Bays, you can see from the map, are uh, on the Atlantic coast, uh, the coast of Maryland, parts of Delaware, and parts of Virginia. Uh, briefly, the environmental literacy of the coastal bays are that they're shallow, productive coastal lagoons performed by dynamic barrier islands that uh, have shored migration, overwash, and breaching. There's limited ocean exchange between the, the bays and the Atlantic Ocean, and therefore large gradients in water residence time and all associated water quality. Uh, the inputs for water are dominated by groundwater with elevated nutrients from septic systems and agriculture runoff. There's high habitat and biotic diversity in these uh, shallow productive lagoons. And there's an ongoing ecological transition occurring in Chincoteague Bay. Uh, more eutrophication uh, symptoms are being expressed. These were traditionally called the forgotten bays, but they've clearly been discovered with more people and more pressures. So I'll go through each of those seven individually. First of all, the shallow productive coastal lagoons. Coastal lagoons are uh, the formal uh, definition of them is, is given by this energy between river, wave, and tide. And you can see that uh, there's very little tides uh, in coastal lagoon systems. And, and very little river impact. It's mostly driven by wave energy, but there is sufficient amount of fresh water to keep the openings go, uh, uh, alive uh, and, uh, and exchanging with the ocean. So they're not strand plains, which are completely sealed off. So, uh, and, and I like the, the, the DC definition of the French term for lagoon. Uh, uh, you know, Chesapeake Bay is, is unique, and everything focuses on its uniqueness, but coastal lagoons are not unique. They are, they are a large percent of the world's coastline. I've seen figures around 13, 15% of the world's coastlines are coastal lagoonal systems. Um, <clears throat> and as such, they're, they're quite generic. Uh, you can be in a two meter deep uh, coastal lagoon in Laguna Madre, Texas, uh, or Chincoteague Bay, or uh, on the west coast of Australia, and, and it's it's almost identical. They're, they're very similar uh, in morphology and, and habitats. Uh, there are two different kinds of coastal lagoons within um, uh, the stretch of, of the Delmarva Peninsula, uh, Delaware, Maryland, Virginia Peninsula. You can see these, uh, the macrotidal, mac microtidal ones uh, that are like Chincoteague Bay on the left with a, a, a narrow barrier island and a lot of open water and some fringing marshes uh, on either side of the, the embayment. But when you get uh, a little more uh, tidal range, uh, you get um, uh, these drumstick, shorter, uh, thicker coastal uh, barrier islands and lots of marsh, salt marsh in between uh, the barrier islands and the mainland. And so that's to the south, if you go south of Chincoteague, uh, or Wilds Island, into the Virginia, those are the drumstick barrier island systems. So features of coastal lagoons, we talk about their shallowness, and that helps make them very productive. Uh, they're dynamic. They have restricted exchange through inlets. Very small watersheds. The whole watershed of the Maryland coastal bays is given on that map. Um, so there's unlike Chesapeake, which extend, watershed extends up into upstate New York. They're susceptible to harmful algal blooms because of high residence time and nutrient inputs. Typical habitats of coastal lagoons include the salt marshes, mangroves in, in tropical areas, and seagrasses, both tropical and temperate. Typical living re resources are shellfish dominated. A lot of these coastal lagoons were very productive historically with clams, oysters, and or scallops, and various fin fish like summer flounder. And groundwater is very important as an input. So the barrier islands are are always moving. Uh, there's overwash and breaching, and you can see uh, in this upper photo, this is Ocean City to the top of the um, uh, the all the development you see, and then the in Ocean City Inlet, and then Aspeague Island National Seashore, which is allowed to uh, natural processes. So why is Ocean City sticking out there? Well, it's sticking out there because uh, and it was uh, one continuous beach back in 1850, you see here, but uh, starting in 1933, uh, this breach was formed, and 
then the island processes were allowed to manage as the island rolled over itself, uh, figuratively, um, until it's in this current uh, just, uh, situation where ocean city is maintained by offshore dredging every year, where large dredges offshore pump sand onshore to protect the businesses and development in ocean city. Uh, this is a breach, uh, one of the many that have occurred uh, in uh, the inlet, uh, I mean, in the um, the island, and this little inlet that was temporarily created by uh, Hurricane Sandy um, down towards the southern part of uh, uh, Estig Island is is uh, filled up naturally, and it's uh, it still continues to breach to this day. Ultimately, that probably won't be the case for sea level rise. But, and, and here's another aerial photo of Ocean City and then the Assateague National Seashore. Um, and so here's the gradients of, of water resonance times as demonstrated by the total nitrogen map. So this is um, oceanic influence coming in the inlet here of Ocean City uh, and going into Cinnabuxet Bay and Isle White Bay, and then Chicopee Inlet, which flushes the southern part of the bay. So in the middle of Chicopee and Newport Bay in particular, got water quality problems because of uh, lack of effective flushing through tidal um, that, that, you know, these, these inlets are rather restricted, they're, they're both not very deep and they're um, very narrow. Now, uh, eutrophication. So we've, we've done some uh, studies on this and there are three independent uh, studies that have come up with um, uh, sources of nutrients. One was the sediment cores from the uh, agricultural dominated watershed here. And you can see um, some of these really high uh, phosphorus levels. We track sewage plumes with uh, uh, stabilisotopes uh, of nitrogen and found um, that uh, in macroalgal incubations, we found Chicopee Island. Remember from the previous slide that um, that Chicopee, near Chicopee Island, it was really well flushed in low concentrations of nutrients. That said, there are sewage nutrients that are emanating from this island and essentially it's a big sandbar with 3,000 residents all on septic systems that flushes straight into the bay. There's also a sewage signal associated with Ocean Pines sewage discharge. Ocean City discharges offshore, and that's what we're seeing here uh, in the end of the summer. Um, uh, Judy O'Neill took a uh, research cruise, and the Ocean City discharge occurs uh, right about um, right about where these 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 plots are. And with the southern flow, you can see this nitrate, and that's also manifesting phosphorus and chlorophyll levels. So any re-entrainment of those waters through the inlet will, will inflate the nutrient uh, in, in, inside the bay. Um, if we look throughout the entire Delmarva, we start in Delaware, and then we have the uh, Maryland Coastal Bays, and then we have these Virginia seaside bays, as they call them. And uh, this is all, interestingly, Coastal Reserve, owned by the Nature Conservancy. So it's very uh, minimally developed. Um, Delaware is pretty intensively developed, Rehoboth and, and other uh, beaches, and of course, Ocean City in Maryland. And so what we've got on this gradient, we start in Delaware, we've got you know, lots of macroalgae and hyperalgal blooms, a lot of turbidity, lots of runoff, uh, not very well managed in terms of nutrients. Um, Maryland Coastal Bay is somewhere in between, and then Virginia, almost pristine um, water quality associated with flushing in the bay. Some uh, agricultural in that narrow uh, watershed, there is some um, agricultural inputs that are also impacting it. And the gradient here in, in seagrasses is, is, is seen here where, where we're al almost in this uh, nutrient limited area down in the Virginia seaside bays, and they've done some seagrass uh, replanting, seed uh, introduction, and they've got massive expansion of seagrasses. In the 1990s, we saw uh, the Maryland Coastal Bays expanding in their seagrasses, uh, but uh, now we're reaching, we've reached this situation in the Maryland Coastal Bays where we've moved into the light limited, and we've got lots of macroalgae and turbidity that are uh, now uh, reducing those seagrasses. Uh, the Barrier Island represents a, a complex of different habitats, and you can see this cross-section of, of the, the, the Barrier Island. You see 
uh, going from the bay side, the subtitle, seagrass beds and mudflats and salt marshes. Uh, the ponies, the uh, Chincoteague ponies, are, are foraging on the, the, the grasses and, and, and on the marsh uh, and, and, and uh, degrading the marsh, as well as uh, there's some deer, uh, na native and, and reduced deer uh, populations as well. So these feral animals uh, are, are causing some problems with the marshes. Uh, we have uh, inland wetlands where there are little perched uh, freshwater um, areas and forest and shrubland. And then the dune system uh, with, with beach grasses, uh, mothla type uh, species, and, and then the beach and intertidal, and then giving way to the Atlantic subtidal. So they're very complex, and a lot of this has to do with uh, the groundwater underneath that supports those populations. Here's that ecological transition that I mentioned with the seagrasses. The seagrasses expanded in the 90s, peaked around 2000, uh, crashed after a particularly um, warm summer event in 2005, and have been kind of holding, holding uh, at a new sort of, but, but perhaps even still declining. Uh, the nutrients uh, were uh, doing pretty well in terms of nutrient concentrations, long-term I don't know, we lost the, um, lost the time frame, but 2000 is about here. It started in 1985. So the nutrients were, were declining, but then you can see they're starting to creep back up again. So there's an ongoing problem with too many nutrients. And you can see these in these water quality um, graphs that have to do with uh, both the, the relative change over time as well as the, the, the current status. And so when you go up these streams, you see that uh, there's um, they're generally uh, you know degraded. Uh, so you can see these these red dots are high stream nitrogen, phosphorus, and chlorophyll, uh, and then this little diagram that, that goes into the details of the nitrogen, phosphorus, and chlorophyll trend. The only place that's really degrading are up in the Newport Bay area and down at Chincoteague Island. So that's actively degrading in terms of water quality. That said, um, there, uh, you know, there, there are some areas here which are improving, which are in pretty good shape in, in the bay itself. But our problem is is stemming from a lot of this from land. These are stream nitrate values that are surveyed annually, and you can see over a 10-year period, uh, particularly down near the Virginia border, and particularly chicken uh, farms are causing degradation here. The town of Berlin is, is, uh, doesn't have a, a discharge. They use uh, land irrigation as their treated effluent. Town of Ocean City is pumped offshore, as I said before. So these forgotten bays are increasingly under pressure. They have this annual uh, pony swim for the Chincoteague uh, Fire Department. Lots of fishing, lots of uh, uh, weekend and holiday, but the weekends are longer, the holidays are longer, the summer season is longer for these um, these areas and people don't aren't they're just there for the ocean but also for the embayments behind it. So and this is typical. Uh, this is what's happening pretty much globally, I would say, is that there are increasing pressures on coastal lagoons and that's because everybody wants to live on the coast, uh, more moderate climate. They tend to be on septic systems because they're in very rural areas, not on sewers, and septic systems don't process as much nutrient. We've got atmospheric inputs that, you know, a lot of driving, a lot of power plants that sort of support this, that create an NOx. In the, in the case of Maryland, we've actually got declining uh, atmospheric inputs currently. Groundwater inputs are a delayed impact. I don't want to do load up the groundwater with ag or, or septic systems. They want to manifest their way into the bay. Uh, inlets are artificially stabilized. The only reason that inlet is still there from 1933 at Ocean City is because the Army Corps of Engineers came in and uh, put jetties and annually uh, pumped sand. Beach nourishment projects are common in most of the East Coast of the United States. Uh, have uh, Tourist beaches tend to have beach nourishment problems, uh, pro problems and projects. And there are storm surges and uh, sea level rise that endanger the coastal communities, but also the habitats and, and what's happening there. So it's, they're very vulnerable as well. So as far as the four, we're going to look at the four uh, things that Don introduced for each of these uh, 
case study. Um, we're going to talk about integration. And one of the things that Maryland Coastal Bays has done a very good job of is integration. We, we've had regular scientific syntheses. The first was 2004 with the state of Maryland Coastal Bays, a book, Shifting Sands, in 2009. And then very recently, uh, just a few months ago, uh, the land and bay perspective of uh, the coastal bays in this document here. And each of these has uh, management recommendations included in these uh, scientific, their scientific synthesis, but also they, they delve into the management recommendations. The next is adaptive management, and that's uh, something that the coastal bays program has been doing pretty well. They're, they're small, they're nimble. Uh, we do an annual report card of the status and, and have a annual release. We have regular integrated assessments, those five year integrated assessments, and we deliver management recommendations regularly. We meet with the implementation committee, which includes the mayors of the Georgia City and Berlin, and, and it includes the state agencies that are uh, secretaries, and it includes um, a lot of the citizen group, and the, you know, I represent the science group, and so we do this on a regular basis and, and, and try, trying to move, move things forward. Uh, in terms of precautionary principles, not so good. There's ongoing degradation that we've documented. There's the, the burden of proof has been on the science and management to show this problem. Here's a, just a picture of ocean pines, a, a, a canal state development that was created. Uh, we've identified with tracers these different sources, the septic systems. We've got agricultural runoff. We've got some, you know, DNA and stuff showing that. These uh, isotopes for some of the septics and these offshore nutrient plumes. So we have evidence and we've communicated to the right people on a regular basis, but we haven't seen much manager response. We've been talking about for 12 years, the Syncopic Island sewage needs a sewage treatment plant. It's crazy that they don't have it. And uh, they're still talking about it and still haven't done anything. And the development pressures are continuing. So I'd say they haven't really achieved the precautionary principles. In terms of sustainability or resilience, um, well, you know, we've got some nutrient load reductions going on uh, with uh, the, the sewage treatment plants, but we're not really tracking that. We need to see how that's going to work. We've got these temporary inlets that form after these storms. This is in 2016. It wasn't even sandy. And this is just um, a, a smaller event. And you can see that that's going to change the character of these lagoons. And the impact of these breaches really needs to be understood. So there's, there's a whole lot to find out about the sustainability and resilience of these. In terms of resources, uh, we've got one paper that uh, summarizes the water quality issues, and then this uh, this one. It's actually one booklet. It looks like two. It's it's uh, two for one. It it, it uh, you approach it from from either end and uh, has a good overview of the situation and uh, some of the management recommendations. 